sometimes it seems like it just kind of jumps by, but you know, it's a, I don't know, looking out the trees, it's not been that long ago, there weren't any leaves, uh, things were bare, and every year, it, the leaves come out, the seasons, and you know, it talks about that in the Bible and stuff, and we, we talked about it a little bit in Sunday school and stuff about the seasons, and God, you know, clothing the flowers and taking care of us and we worry and we're not supposed to worry and, and stuff. But anyway, it, uh, it really all leads back to prayer and stuff. But anyway, uh, I don't know how many of you, do uh, you look around and you see a need, something needs to be taken care of. Okay, there's two things you can do. One is try to find somebody to do it, which usually doesn't work. <laughs> And the other is you can do it yourself. God used a lot of people, mostly uneducated in the world's eyes. And Moses was one of them. When God told Moses to go to Egypt to rescue his people, he said, why me? Why not somebody else? I'm not a good speaker. He had all kinds of excuses. But God didn't let him out of it. And God was with him. And you know the stories... And how he brought him out. I mean, he was very powerful. But God, it was God's power. God does not need us to do the things he does. That's for our benefit of the world to see God's power. Just like the offering we just took. God doesn't need that money. It's, it, it's more up to us what we're going to give. It's, it's more of a challenge to us to see what kind of faith we have and stuff. So, uh, you know, just like talking about the uneducated, just like the apostles, you know, other than Luke, the physician, there was a what, fisherman, tax collector, and I'm not sure on some of the other, but most of them other than Luke, I think were just men of the world, just common jobs and stuff. But they were his people, and he made them great. Um, so, uh, I guess what I'm getting at, if you see a need, then, then pray, pray for it, uh, and actually step up, let God use you. Uh, the same here at the church. You know, the needs here, the needs in the world. Uh, you know, and it's all God's will. And all like in, in Luke twenty two forty two, when Jesus was praying in the garden, and He said, "Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me." You know, it really wasn't what Jesus wanted to do personally, but He said, "Yet yeah, not my will, but yours be done." And that's what we need to say too. You know, whenever, uh, you know, when the uh, kind of what we're getting up to about this point in the service is about Jesus dying on the cross and why we why we take the cup and the loaf. You know, the, uh, it was about Jesus when he was beat, his body was broken, and that's what the bread represents, and the cup represents his blood that was shed. In First Corinthians eleven twenty four and twenty five, it says, and when Jesus had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the same manner, uh, also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. And that's, that's what we do. When we take this cup and this loaf, like I said, it represents Jesus' body and His blood, and what He done for us. He was the perfect sacrifice. Our sins are forgiven. You, know, you just have to ask. Uh, you have to believe. And that's what this represents. It's just the promise of eternal life. There again, like in Sunday school, we talked about, you know, we worry about things on this earth. But yet, even though we know we've got eternal life in heaven coming, we still worry about this earth and this life. And it's hard not to do. It's really all we know except we have to have the faith about God, what He says, and about the life, eternal life that we have, that He has promised and that will be there as a gift for us. So if you would, let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we do thank You, Lord, for this day. We do thank You for this time in the service, Lord, where we, we celebrate uh, the death of Jesus, Lord, the, uh, the shedding of His blood and His, His broken body, Lord, and we hate it that it's because of our sins that he done all this suffering and had to go to the cross, Lord, but we are thankful that he did. We're thankful that he carried out God's, your, your cup, Lord, and, and your wishes, Lord. 
Lord, I pray that you give us strength that we can do the same, Lord. And at this time, I pray that you bless this cup and this loaf. And Lord, please bless those that partake of it. In Jesus' name, amen. We're very sorry to hear about Bertie. Uh, I know for the Christian, there are worse things than, than dying. And so for, for Bertie, we're confident she's with the Lord and George and all of the family of hers that's come on before her in Christ. And, and so uh, I'm, we're probably going to announce, uh, if you didn't know, the, the funeral is Tuesday, I think. Uh, it's here at the cemetery in the chapel here in Wayne City. And uh, 1 o'clock is visitation until 2 o'clock. And then the funeral's at 2 o'clock there at the chapel. And then uh, we'll be having a dinner here at the church following. So um, we certainly want to continue to remember that family. Um, I got to get into my phone here because there was an article and I had it on my phone, but I didn't have it anywhere else. So, um, you know, today's June the sixth. Last week we, you know, celebrated uh, celebrates the word uh, Memorial Day. Uh, we commemorated it and uh, the weekend. And today is actually the anniversary of, of D Day. And uh, as Scott said, uh, you know, Kevin had a great meditation that went along with that, um, that whole theme. And um, I, I ran across an article just uh, the last day or two, and I thought it was interesting, and it goes along with what I want to talk about later, how Jesus Christ is a stumbling block to this world. And there's a passage in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 that I'll read that talks about that word. Paul, Paul talks about that, but this, this article was um, from firstliberty.org and uh, it stated May 28th, 2021. It says a 16-year-old Michael Carlson had one goal with his Eagle Scout project, to honor American veterans. For nearly two years, he labored to, to plan, raise private funds for and built a veteran's memorial in his hometown of Monument, Colorado. The memorial is particularly special to Michael as his grandfather served in World War II and his own father served in Vietnam. When Michael presented the completed project to the town in October of 2020, he called it a dream come true. The memorial sits in the town cemetery and includes a crescent stone wall, recognition of the private donors who funded the project, a battlefield cross, and a headstone sporting the insignias of six military branches, as well as the following statement. And here's a statement that caused the problem. It says, only two defining forces have ever offered to die for you, Jesus Christ, and the American soldier. One died for your soul, the other died for your freedom. We honor those who made freedom a reality. Sadly, the article continues, that statement has made Michael's Eagle Scout project the target of an outrageous attack from the usual suspects known for creating problems where they don't exist. <laughs> The deceptively named Military Religious Freedom Foundation, or the MRFF, despite claiming that he was not directing an attack against the young Eagle Scout or questioning his intentions, MRFF founder Mikey Weinstein called the project, quote, a wretched unconstitutional dumpster fire. Um, MRFF threatened to sue the town of Monument, claimed that because the memorial's headstone referenced Christianity, it amounted to a violation of the First Amendment's Establishment Clause or government's promotion of one religion over another. Remember, however, the memorial was privately funded, planned by Michael's own efforts. That means the headstone inscription referencing Michael's religious beliefs is private religious speech. The religious reference in no way suggests that the government is discriminating, excluding, or failing to honor military veterans of all faiths or those of no faith for their sacrifice. Also, while located in the town cemetery, Michael's family purchased the plots where the memorial sits 
ensuring that the town does not own the memorial and is not responsible for its maintenance. Uh, First Liberty jumped in to, to defend Michael in the town of Monument, demanding an apology from Weinstein, and that's an apology uh, yet to be given, and it, it goes on from there. And the thing that was so offensive was the reference of, of Jesus Christ. There's a, a story about a little girl who prou proudly wore a shiny cross on a chain around her neck, and one day she was approached by a man who said to her, little girl, don't you know that the cross Jesus died on wasn't beautiful like the one you're wearing? It was an ugly wooden thing. But the little girl kind of quick on her feet, she responded, yes, I know, but they told me in Sunday school that whatever Jesus touches, he changes. And that's true. That's the power of the cross. That's part of the, that's a part of the message that that's the message that Paul gives us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 18 through 20, where he says, "The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate." Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? And then in verses 22 through 25, he continues. He says, Jews demand miraculous signs. Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. You know, people have, have always wanted God's stamp of approval upon their lifestyle, never requiring any change for the better. And they've, they've come up with all kinds of, of euphemisms or ways to, to phrase things that, that sound all right. And so uh, what years ago we used to call living in sin is now called a committed relationship. What used to be called abstinence is now neurotic inhibition. And what used to be called killing the unborn is now called pro-choice. See, Jesus encountered that attitude in his day. People who wanted... God's stamp of approval on their lifestyle and that they would, not they would not have to change. Jesus looked at the Pharisees and the Sadducees and he called them hypocrites in whitewashed tombs. On the outside they appeared to be pious and prayerful and obedient to God, but inside they were rotten to the core. They're like people today. Far too many who want a God who doesn't require any change in us and places his stamp of approval on whatever it, or whatever way it is that we want to live, contrary to God's uh, specified and revealed word. But sooner or later, we bump into that old rugged cross, and there we meet a God who says, I don't like your sin. In fact, it's so horrible that it requires me to go to the cross and suffer and die to free you from the punishment you deserve. That's the love. He, God doesn't hate us, but He hates our sin. Because it, it is a very, very costly proposition when we rebel against God. But then, he, Paul, in this passage, he declares that the Jews, and he's talking about the leadership of the Jews, the Jews stumble over the cross, and the Greeks think it is foolishness, but others see in it the power and the wisdom of God. And there are still those three kinds of people in the world today. You know, I, 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 I keep coming back to Jesus and the cross because in this world today, we are confronted with a myriad of problems and issues. Things get blurred. Things get confusing. And yet there is still one answer to the problems that this world faces, just like it's always been, and he's Jesus Christ. And even though people are offended at the, word, uh, the words, Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, it is still true. He is still the Savior, and He is still the answer to this world problem, and we have to keep going back. Now, first of all, Paul talked about the Jews. The Jews stumbled, and, and remember, Paul was a Jew. You know, what's anti Semitic? Well, Jesus was a Jew. Paul was a Jew. The disciples were Jews. He's talking about the attitude of the religious leaders and those people who rejected Christ as the Jewish Messiah, which He was. And the Jews stumbled over it because Jesus wasn't the kind of Messiah that he wanted. And it's strange because the Jews had been carefully picked.
picked by God. He had watched over them, protected them down through the generations, had prepared them to be the nation through whom the Messiah would come and through whom all nations on earth would be blessed. But when he came, they crucified him. And we all crucified him, really. You know, people say, well, you, you, you can't say the Jews killed Christ. Well, in a way, that's true, because we all did. The Romans, the Gentiles, sinful mankind is the reason Jesus had to die on a cross. And when he came, his, his creation put him to death. The Bible says that Jesus came to his own, and those were who were his own did not receive him in John 1 11. Why? Why didn't they receive him? Well, because uh, Paul says Jews demand miraculous signs. They were expecting a, a, a Messiah who could perform miracles on their behalf. Now, Jesus, he, he, he did exactly that. He, he was performing miracles. He was giving sight to the blind. He straightened the legs of the lame. He cleansed the lepers. He was ministering to them and reaching out to meet their needs. But see, as amazing as those miracles were, they weren't the kind of miracles that they wanted. They wanted signs of power and success. They wanted a Messiah who would overthrow the Romans and reestablish the earthly kingdom of David. Uh, if Jesus had marshaled an army and led them into battle, defeated the Romans, if he would have shown them that he was successful and victorious, they would have marched behind him. But the cross got in the way. You know, Ron, you were talking about the, the different various backgrounds of the disciples. One of those guys was a guy named Simon. He was a zealot. He was a freedom fighter. For, he was a, uh, a rebel uh, for, for the Jewish nation. He, he probably thought originally Jesus was going to be that guy that established an army. And they were going to whoop the Romans. <laughs> now you got his mind changed. When he saw really what Jesus' true nature was. You see, dying on the cross doesn't look like success or power. It doesn't look like victory. In fact, it even kind of looks like weakness. It looks like failure. It looks like defeat. And so the Jews kept stumbling over it. It kept getting in the way. And not only did they have a false concept of the Messiah, they also had a false concept of salvation. They thought that the way to salvation was through their own righteousness. And so they were busy keeping the law. There are people today who think if they can just be good enough, or if they can actually just be better than the worst people, then God's going to let them into heaven. They think they can earn their salvation, and that's what it amounts to. And that's the way the Jews were. But they weren't keeping God's law. They were just going through the motions. Going to the synagogue the synagogue at the appointed time. Saying their, pra their prayers loudly so that all could hear. Giving their offerings in such a way that everybody was in impressed by their generosity. They appeared to be pious and prayerful and generous. I think today we use the term virtue signaling. They were real good at virtue signaling. And I'm afraid that you know that's just like people today in the world. But the Jewish people, the leadership that rejected Jesus, they thought they didn't need a Savior. They didn't need anybody to die on the cross for them. They thought the way to salvation was through their own righteousness, which they very carefully defined to their own liking. And people do that too. And so the Jews, as a result, kept stumbling over the cross. But then Paul, he talks about the Greeks. Um, in verse 22, he says, the Greeks look for wisdom. They were the intelligentsia of the day. They were the men who produced uh, men like uh, Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, the great thinkers. Many of them uh, we read even to this day. And Socrates said the secret to a successful society is education. He said if we can just give everybody a good education, then it must follow that the world will get better and better. You see any fallacy in that? It depends on who's educating you and what they teach very very familiar to us we've been told that for generations education will solve all our problems all we need is more education and mankind will become better and better but we haven't have we see once again who is doing the educating and what are they teaching now we're, we're certainly not opposed to education but it's just that you know 
you can learn everything there is to learn and still have a fatal flaw. And that fatal flaw is the very thing that this world does not recognize, and that is the existence of sin. That we have an offend, we've offended an almighty God and creator. And until we deal with that, we can learn everything in the world and still be lost. 17th chapter of Acts describes the scene when Paul came to Athens. And the Athenian philosophers met on a place called Mars Hill, the Areopagus, and they sat there all day thinking their profound thoughts. And Luke says that they spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. And then one day the Apostle Paul went up to Mars, Mars Hill and started telling them about a God who was unknown to them. He saw a, a monument in Athens that said, uh, t uh, you know, to an unknown God, a memorial to an unknown God. They just they had so many gods they were afraid they might offend somebody by leaving them out. So this is to the unknown God, you know. And Paul says, well, I know the name of that God, <laughs> that unknown God. And he began to tell them about that. He said that God came to earth, walked among men, died on the cross, rose again. But you know what? It was all foolishness to them. And there are people that think like that, obviously, today as well. See, uh, they, they want to, people want to think that they, they use reason and they use their intelligence and their mind, even though really most people use their feelings. What feels right to them is what they think is right. But anyway, reason, they say, tells you that, that babies aren't born to virgin girls. And reason tells you that God doesn't become flesh. And reason tells you that Almighty God will not allow puny men to nail him to a cross. And reason tells you that when a man dies, he cannot be resurrected back to life again. See, none of that makes sense to this world. And so the Greeks looked at the cross as foolishness. They also had a different concept of salvation. Actually, it's a, a concept of salvation that's very common in the world. The Greeks believe that all souls are immortal. Therefore, when you die, you automatically go to be with the gods. And if your life was good enough, then you stayed with the gods. But if your life wasn't good enough, then you were reincarnated into another body, and then you got another chance. And you just keep trying and trying until you get it right. And that way, everybody is finally saved. Nobody is lost. You just keep getting reincarnated until finally uh, everybody is one with the gods. You didn't need a savior because in their thinking, everybody was going to be saved. And so when it came to hearing about a cross, to them, that was foolishness. They would think, why does anybody have to go to a cross and die? We're all going to be saved anyway. And there are a lot of people today that think that. It's called universalism. That God just basically saves everybody. Oh, they might carve out a few people like Hitler or, you know, insert your, you know, magnum, megalomaniacal, how do you say it? Megalomaniacal there. Megalomaniacal. That is a hard word. If you can say that word right, you're probably one of those people. <laughs> you would, that means you would have had to practice it. But anyway, you know, we'll maybe say, oh, yeah, that person really deserves to, to die. But not everybody. You know, God's going to save everybody. That's really what people think today. That's not new thinking. That's as old as Mars Hill. So finally, what about today? You know, man hasn't really learned anything new. We, we, we still keep sending the same old things, still thinking the same false thoughts, still stumbling over the same cross, still laughing at the wisdom of God and treating it as foolishness. You know, I was thinking the other day, and I need to do some more study on this. But, you know, back in the Garden of Eden, when um, God told Adam and Eve not to partake of the, 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 the fruit of the forbidden tree, and what was it? It was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, you know, I think, well, wouldn't that be a kind of a good thing to have the knowledge of good and evil? You know, why was that such a tempting thing? And why did Satan try to tempt them to eat that one? They only had one rule in the Garden of Eden. Can you, can you imagine living a world in a world where there's just one rule? You know? <laughs> and that's all they had. One, one thing that God didn't want them to do. And I, got, you know, I was kind of thinking about this, and I, I, somebody had suggested this, and I'm not saying this is the correct interpretation, but rather that when they ate that fruit, often depicted as an apple, uh, I don't know what it was, uh, that when they ate the truth of the knowledge of good and evil, it wasn't that now they were aware of right and wrong so much that, oh, that's wrong, I won't do that. What it was was perhaps they 
thought, I can decide what's right and wrong. I will make up what I think is right and wrong. And so if I want to do this one particular thing, this lifestyle, this behavior, this activity, all the things listed in the Ten Commandments, if I decide that those are okay, then that knowledge of good, I decide what is good and what is evil. And that kind of makes sense to me because that's what people do. They decide in their minds what they want to do and they then try to get God to put their stamp of, his stamp of approval on that. You see, we still think in these same ways where we rebel against God. We laugh at the wisdom of God. We treat it as foolishness. Michael Bird, a minister in Australia years ago, told about a well-known American preacher who gave some advice to an Australian congregation. This guy said, don't tell people about the cross. It doesn't work. That's why the Franklin Graham Crusades are no longer effective. Just tell them that God loves them and has a plan for them. See, the, the crux of his advice was that the message of a crucified Jew is ridiculous to the modern man. So move on to something better. A crucified Messiah is stupid, but promise them prosperity. Give them emotional experiences. Provide them with self-esteem. Then you'll fill the pews. And you know what? We can have churches that are filled to the brim with people who are lost and don't have a clue about what Jesus truly expects of them, about what the cross really means. Make no mistake about it, the Christ who miraculously confronted Saul on the road to Damascus, that persecutor of Christians, is the same Christ who confronts today us with that unchanging message of the cross. A guy by the name of George McLeod wrote a poem that helps to put a lot of things in perspective. He said, he said this, I simply argue that the cross be raised again at the center of the marketplace as well as on the steeple of the church. I am recovering the claim that Jesus was not crucified in a cathedral between two candles, but on a cross between two thieves, on a town garbage heap at a crossroad of politics so cosmopolitan that they had to write his title in Hebrew and in Latin and in Greek. And at that kind of place where cynics talk smut and thieves curse and soldiers grumble. Because that is where he died and that is what he died about. And that is where Christ's men ought to be and what church people ought to be about. The salvation is for a lost and dying world. Out there in the blood and the grit and the dirt and the mud. Out there in the real world where people live. There's a lot of things that we don't understand, but remember, God accomplished that which was impossible when He went to the cross and died for our sins. He did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. The late Chuck Colson wrote in his book, Kingdoms in Conflict, he said, the print medium often intentionally distorts what we write. Over the years since I became a Christian, I've always deliberately explained that I have accepted Jesus Christ. He said, these words are invariably translated into, quote, Colson's professed religious experience, unquote. He said, I discovered that one major U.S. daily newspaper, as a matter of policy, will not print the two words, Jesus Christ, together. Because when combined, the editor says, it represents an editorial judgment. <laughs> At least he understands that Christ is not Jesus' last name. That Jesus <laughs> is the Christ. Jesus is the Messiah, the Holy One of God. It's his title. It's what he came to do. It's who he is because of what he accomplished and who he is. In a way, it is an edit, it's more than just an editorial judgment. It is a statement of fact, and it offends the world to this day. But it's the answer to this world's problems. He is the answer to this world's problems, and that's what the cross represents. As I close, I, I read this incident about a, a, an officer, a police officer, who was <laughs> patrolling one night, in northern England years ago and as he was out there patrolling he, he heard a quivering sob from the shadows 
turning in the direction from which it came, he saw in the shadows a little boy sitting on a doorstep, and that little boy had tears rolling down his cheeks. And the child whispered the words, I'm lost, take me home. Policemen began naming street after tree, street, trying to help the little boy remember where he lived, but when that failed, he, re he repeated the names of the shops and the hotels in the area. Boy, he couldn't remember those. And then the officer remembered that in the center of the city was a well-known church with a large white cross towering high above the surrounding landscape. He pointed to it and he said, do you live near anywhere near where that is? And he pointed to the cross. And the boy's face immediately brightened. He says, yes, take me to the cross. I can find my way home from there. That's, that's the answer, isn't it? <laughs> Take me to the cross and we can find our way home from there. That's still true. will always be true until Christ comes again. We're going to sing a song of decision this morning. If you've never accepted what Christ did on the cross, never accepted Him as Lord and Savior, and confessed and repented and been baptized into Him, you can do those things today. You can give your life to Christ and not stumble over that anymore. You can actually embrace Him. And you can do it as we, we stand and sing.